Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Let's Remember Skies of Arcadia. We have made it back to Crescent Isle. We have the purple moon crystal. Let me stop for a moment. Last segment, I was like, hey, sounds all great. Listen to this music in Glacia. It's pretty cool. Turns out the game audio wasn't running, but um, that's hard to tell sometimes. Like, it runs for me no matter what. So I apologize again for my crazy difficulties with the audio. Um, let us just pretend it was a fortuitous accident and assume that the silence of Glacia was uh, taking over my recording equipment. Um, so instead, now we are back um, in uh, Crescent Isle. It's been upgraded again, um, and I want to show you some of that before we head forward, because the next segment we are going to get the yellow moon crystal, and it's not too difficult, so I will show off the changes to Crescent Isle. I will get us our last two crew members, and then we will move straight towards where we are going to go in order to get the yellow moon crystal. Yeah! But now we can fly above the cloud layer, or below the cloud layer, and I really want to show that off. So what I might do is show off um, sort of how that works on our way towards our first crew member that we'll recruit, and then I will show it off um, on our way to our... Well, I won't show it off, excuse me, to the next one. We'll just do a jump cut to our final crew member. Uh, but you'll also be able to see it um, as we move towards the uh, the next dungeon, which will be actually an airship dungeon, if I'm getting my order of events correct. So that will be it. But you can see, once we get up top here, Crescent Isle is looking good. Um, so, not everything is usually upgraded like this. I've done plenty of time sort of off-camera getting stuff set up, but let's sort of look over things again. Gonzalez has a, uh, a right and proper grave, and his spirit will watch over us. Um, and so what you can do is you can either have Ismael here remodel something or decorate things, um, but let's see if we can have him remodel anything. No, Khalifa's tent is okay. I can't back out. Um, so let's say that we want him to remodel the living quarters, right? So it's all right. Um, that's something that he's already remodeled, but I can go to him or uh, Kirala to get upgrades. This should be uh, Kilafa's tent, where I can walk in and sort of talk and get my fortune read. We've upgraded her tent um, with a little bit of uh, Yafu Tillman fl flare. We have a fountain in the middle. Our tavern is Yafu Tillman. To sort of reflect the fact that Urala is our cook. And Merida is up there on stage, um, sort of uh, dancing in Yafu Tillman garb instead. Dawn, um, Polly, and uh, Robinson again, Urala. Pretty great stuff. The living quarters are a little fancier. Much more home, uh, homey, right? And, you know, here's Hans. We recruited him. Um, really good as our engineer. I, I like I like Hans quite a bit. Um, and then we also have a fountain where I have... Um, I've gotten fish put in. And then you have an option to put one of the uh, primary three characters' faces there. I put Fina's there. One, because I really like Fina. And then two, it's like, without her... Um, None of the uh, sort of characters would have come together for this quest, so it feels sort of thematically appropriate. Um, although, as evidenced by my fact that I'm also using the Delphinus flag, I just really like the associated stuff ar around um, around Fina and the imagery. Um, Moegi's down here, um, but we have a right and good base, and that will be expanded once we get uh, our our artisans which will be really great. So for now, that's sort of the gist of things. We are going to head up to the sort of meeting room, plan our next uh, bit of action, and go from there. So I'll, I'll show you what the next bit of action will be, sort of what our plan is, and then we will get our last two crew members and then go on our journey to get the, um, I believe it is the yellow moon crystal. We're heading back to Valua. 
So all we need now are the yellow crystal and the silver crystal. Um, Fina says the Sylvite elders already have the silver crystal. So we're okay. All we really need is the yellow. Sounds pretty good. Almost sounds too good to be true. Um, and there's still plenty of story left to go, so obviously all sorts of things will happen. Um, but we can maybe bypass the seal at the Maw of Tardis by going underneath the continent, like so. Which is a very cool sort of concept of, of flying around and going underneath the continent to find um, to find the moon crystal. I really like that. So that will be our next um, sort of plan. And we will leave for Valua in the morning. Really and enjoy the, uh, the fact that the purple segment and the yellow segment sort of back away a little bit from crazy interactions and, and just give us sort of traditional questing. Um, it sounds funny to say that I enjoy that after how much I sort of gushed over uh, Yafutoma, but I think in the last segment I also talked about how much I really enjoy Glacia. Um, this, this game, like I said, has very good pacing, and so by picking up the pace at which we get the moon crystals, it sort of picks up the pace by which the rest of the plot will sort of advance. It's like, okay, you've been going on this fetch quest sort of to get the, uh, the powerful moon crystals, and now um, we're going to just sort of let you get them, and then the plot will sort of um, fast forward and, and move from there. And I, I really enjoy that. It sort of knows when, when the fetch quest has sort of outstayed its welcome. So now, though, we can go up above the cloud layer, which is fantastic. Um, so for instance, um, the end of this rainbow. We have found Rainbow Island. Um, now we know what lies at the end of the rainbow, um, which is great. And then for instance, if we head towards here, that giant blinking sort of satellite thing from before, now we can actually discover that as well. The Iron Star. A strange object said to have been launched by the ancient civilization of the Red Moon. Um, nobody knows sort of what it's uh, there for, but it's another one of those things where it's like, okay, you have this space, you have items in the space that you can sort of intimate the meaning behind. Um, so I just want to show off sort of navigation in the upper sky and see like now the world map is really open to me if I need to go somewhere I can go below the cloud layer or above the cloud layer and just really get to where I want to go and it, and so now all of the world map is open to me in, in a really powerful and uh, really great way but we are on our way to find one of our other crew members that we will get um, it is the alchemist Ilkmus. Ilkmus? He's got a weird name. Weird, weird pronunciations. Um, so, if the guide stones or the philosopher stones are there, um, I think those are the philosopher stones. Um, not the magical philosopher stones, um, but something else. So, we can land here on this sort of high flying, deserted looking island, but it's not deserted at all. Um, it is where we will find. Um, we will find another member for our crew. Ilkimus. Ilkimus. Um, studies medicine. Um, very wonderful. Fun character. Kind of gives us a lot of uh, powerful options. Would you like to join our crew? Why can he not travel with us? I forget. There's a cham here. Where is the cham? Is it outside? No, there it is. Okay. So. All you need to know is that I will recruit Ilkmus at a 
different time. We will give the Cham to Cupel so I don't forget. Um, but at the very least, I got to show off sort of how moving about the sky works. Which means, um... I don't... I legitimately don't remember the recruitment process for Ilkmus then. Maybe it's a story trigger. Um, I don't think so. The hardest one to get is the next fellow that we will meet. And you will meet him uh, once I do a quick cut, so... Whoa, 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 whoa. What? I'm at Ilkmus's island again? Haha. -ha. It was a ruse. A trick. Um, if I return to Ilkmus, um, if I ask, it turns out that I will be able to recruit Ilkmus. Um, was a nobleman of Valua, ran away. Um, we need to have somebody who has a heart full of... We, we need to be somebody who um, can cast Ryslam. Um, so somebody in our party needs to cast Ryslam. Um, Fina knows Ryslam, so now we can recruit Ilkmus. So, <laughs> I was messing with you a little bit. That is how we get Ilkmus. But I will do another cut to show off um, our next crew member. So once again, whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, look, another island. Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. And it didn't take long to get there. Even though I made the cut, I can fly above the sky layer and get where I can go. Even though I don't know you, I sense a courage welling deep inside you. Perhaps you might be worthy of my attention. I am Ryu Khan. I was once a well-known swordsmith. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> we get uh, our last member of the crew. So, Ryu Khan has joined the crew as an artisan. Um, really phenomenal. And now, if we check it, um, our crew is complete. Ryukon on active, um, because if we want to, he can buff our attack. Um, Ilkmus raises attributes, but that's sort of vague. I want, like, buffed attack and defense. I want something well-defined. But now, the entire crew of the Delphinus has been assembled, and if I explored the Delphinus, I could probably show you um, where all of the really cool people are on the Delphinus, just chilling and hanging out, but... Um, actually, I'm going to make one last cut here, so I can just get to Valua, to the Maw of Tartus, and we can head about getting the Yellow Moon Crystal. I will see you in one more moment. Whoa, 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 whoa. We are underneath Valua, about to find our way towards the depths of the Maw of Tartus. Another one of our airship dungeons, sort of like the Dark Rift. Although this is a lot more straightforward and not as confusing as the Dark Rift. Although to be fair, the Dark Rift is not actually all that confusing. It was mostly, um, it was mostly me just um, forgetting that you could go up, which I am still embarrassed about. Um, so we have all our crew members now, everything's really cool, I got some weapons for everybody off screen, I also may or may not have bought a lot of Paranta Seeds for Vise, which means that when he attacks he's going to do a lot of damage. I bought about 25 of them, and it's an increase of 3 each time. And then I also bought some Vital Seeds for him, about 15. I could spread that out around the party, but really... If I just put it on Vise, like, it'll be great. Oh well. All this talk about that, and I don't even get to show it off. Rain of Swords will take out anything no matter what, but... The point is, now that I can upgrade certain characters' shops and things like that, um, the game just, like, I say breaks open, but this time the game just breaks. Um, if, if you have the money to spend, which you will if you're making all of this, the uh, discoveries, then all of a sudden you just... Like, look at how much damage those Reign of Swords attacks did. That's over 1,000. Um, really impressive. I mean, obviously we're fighting against mooks, but, you know, whatever. 
And we have a Moonberry, though, which means I will do this. Um, although Enrique will eventually leave our party for a little bit, I will summon... Uh, I say summon because it's on screen. I will have him learn his final super move. Um, because, honestly, I don't really need Ika to learn... Epsilon Mirror or Omega Cyclone. Omega Cyclone's a really cool looking skill, um, but I, I really, I don't need her to have it. I can be pretty f strong without it. Um, so the Moff Tardis, I like more compared to the Dark Rift, although the Dark Rift is probably the more interesting space. There's more kind of history in the space and more stuff going on. Um, the Moff Tardis is just a big like it, it's it's so funny um to kind of phrase it this way but it's just like a big cave with a monster in it and i find something sort of appealing about that in a very simple sense um of just like as we've talked about the game knows that we're sort of getting towards the limit of how much it can really get mileage out of the entire like oh get the get the moon crystals thing um and so, in those respects, it sort of moves us along and actually offers us a pretty traditional RPG fare of, like, there's a monster in a cave guarding a crystal, go get it. Um, granted, we have the nice little shift of that monster being in a cave underneath a continent that we need to fly a giant airship to reach, but in principle, it's the same idea of, like, a dragon in a cave with a bunch of gold and you have to go defeat the dragon to get the gold um it's a nice reframing of what is uh, essentially a pretty standard um sort of approach to dungeon building but I, I i like the way that they expand the scale of everything in a way that is sort of interesting I should comment just for a moment. Uh, Vise won't be like one-shotting anything like right away. I will certainly be using um, excess funds that I get off screen to buy more seeds to just like totally make him incredibly powerful, but he's hitting really hard for this time in the game. And these sort of monsters, the sort of plant creatures tend to be really strong uh, defensively anyway. But we're sort of in a very traditional feeling okay. situation, which I like. Um, certainly, Glacia had more implied stuff sort of surrounding it. Um, it was a little bit more interesting, I think, as um, a bit of a change to the RPG format. So we have both sort of an inversion slash subversion slash whatever in Glacia, and then we have a sort of very strong basic reconstruction in the Moth Tardis, um, which to me shows how confident this game can be of just sort of going from one thing and tweaking some of our expectations and then going to another thing and playing them very straight. Um, it's not like all of a sudden Skies of Arcadia has reached this point where it's like, okay, time for us to be clever. It's like, no, it's still confident in providing us with these fairly um, distinct and understandable RPG formats and sort of presents them to us confidently. But it's also still comfortable enough to, to move about and shift certain things. A lot of the major transformations come near the end of the game. Um, the largest one involving the final boss of the game. It, it's, you know, I, I've sort of played up this notion for a bit, and I don't want to give the the idea that it is brilliant, right? Skies is not a brilliant game. Um, what it is is an, an elegant and effective game, which sounds like that should include brilliance somewhere in there, but something can be elegant without being brilliant. Um, <laughs> elegance, again, being depth with the least amount of complexity. So, you can get a lot of depth, whether that's in a narrative sense or in other senses. You can get a lot of depth out of something by keeping something razor sharp, right? So, in this case, it's a matter of, well, we have the traditional RPG form, and we keep it very sharp and very focused, and then we 
take moments every now and then to sort of play with it a bit. Um, and, and I think that's that's really the elegance of Skies. Um, it, it sets up these things. It doesn't really want to overcomplicate things too much. Um, but there are moments where it will make the minor tweaks to sort of adjust the way that we think about the traditional RPG form that it has been using throughout. But in this case, it's, it's more that the game is very comfortable just sort of presenting a traditional sort of dungeon, and the only difference is that it changes the scale of what's going on. But I find that still has a certain compelling nature to it. Um, I believe so, anyway. The tricky thing about the Maw of Tardis, um, <laughs> as evidenced by its name, is just the raw size of the space. Um, I don't particularly think you can find... you can get as, as easily lost. I don't believe so, anyway. Um, I don't remember that being the case, but then again, um, I didn't remember the Dark Rift being that case, and we all saw how that went. The thing is that the scale is very large, which is enjoyable on its sort of own terms, but can also sort of extend the time we're spending in this location a little longer than perhaps is warranted. The nice thing about Glacia was that it was very self-contained and progress through the space was fairly quick. The Mob Tardis is this very traditional space, um, and I admire the confidence of the game to present that sort of really traditional notion right before us with no apologies, but then at the same time it also is like, I enjoy the scale, but also it's, it's possible that it's too big. So while the scale is effective in sort of taking a format that we enjoy and, and adjusting it to make it interesting, at the same time, it sort of extends the game beyond perhaps what is necessary, um, particularly because there's no really clear way of knowing your way around the space too much. We just sort of have to find our way down below the seal and then we'll find the yellow gigas. Um, while I have the time, then, um, first off, sneak attack, that sucks, I will try to show off Enrique's final move. It is called the Judgment. Um, and usually I do not get Enrique's final move because Enrique is usually not the character that I take with me into the final dungeon. Um, you sort of get some characters back. Um, your party expands, and you can choose certain certain ca characters, certain actors. Um, and I usually don't take Enrique, even though he's probably the most effective party member to take. Um, which means I usually do not get his final ability, but here we can show it off. I've also had very good luck with Moonberry Drops in this playthrough. Like, really good luck with those. Uh, <laughs> more so, because there's only a limited amount within the game, and enemies are dropping them fairly well in this playthrough. So here we go, the Judgment. Your trial shall be swift and just. A little, uh, <laughs> little dramatic for us to use against a single enemy, but uh, certainly a very impressive skill. Once again, Skies taking combat space goes as well. to really have these amazingly abstracted um, sort of combat actions, which I really enjoy. Uh, the Judgment is, is one of the most dramatic of those. It, um, you know, summoned to the Colosseum, attacked by, like, a living embodiment of the serpent. We might have made a huge loop. If this is a... <laughs> if this is a strange Dark Rift scenario where I've made a huge loop, I will 
absolutely eat my hat and just skip to where I find the yellow gigas because I am not putting you through any more Shakespeare recitations and I think almost assuredly I have made a giant circle where I previously was saying like oh it's not that hard to get lost here apparently I have turned myself around and made myself sort of regret my words um, Again, the spatial navigation of certain locations in Skies of Arcadia being a little foggier in my memory. There's another area that we're going to enter later on that's a big ship area, and I know, I know it really, really well. But I guess just most of these ship areas, um, I am not a, uh, a properly uh, good navigator. Um, Unless somehow this will take us right below the seal, in which case this preemptive apology is certainly unnecessary. But we will find out in a moment. Every story that we have needs to have an arc within uh, our videos. Will this bring us out? Ooh, where are we going? No, we're below the seal! Holy crap! So my apology was... Uh, very preemptive. So yeah, Mall of Tardis not as bad as I thought. Wow. Um, oof. No matter which way it went, um, I was going to eat my words on that, weren't, wasn't I? So we're below the seal. What is this down here? I wonder if there's anything we can do down here. I always forget, but we should have the Gigas right above us. You can see as I ascend. Sort of sealed away by the old world. Unfortunately, like Rocknum, the crystal is contained within it. Um, and so this is actually funny. We've had two gigas now, and our build-up to them has been very small. So I, I talked about how effective I think that Blueheim's introduction is. And we we earn a lot of, or the game earns a certain degree of pathos for, for Rocknum because we've encountered Rocknum throughout the game. This is Yelgar, and all we can do is just attack it. Like, there's not a lot of fanfare. I mean, we, we previously encountered the seal earlier in the game, so it's not like this is just a, a gigas out of nowhere. But um, there's, there's not a lot of fanfare for this one, which is sort of disappointing, considering how well I think the game has generally um, handled the gigas. So while... I've talked about this space being sort of a traditional RPG dungeon. One of the things that format does do, unfortunately, is it sort of reduces the Gigas into just a simple boss encounter, as opposed to something with higher sort of uh, contextualized uh, stakes. In this case, it's just sort of sneak underground, attack the monster, and, and get it done. Um, certainly, it's a powerful enemy, and the encounter is a, a fairly interesting boss fight. So we will see that as we, you know, fight them. But on a, on a raw level, it's just not as, um, as interesting. Sure, the seal is breaking, and there's some interesting visuals, you know, lightning firing up into the sky. I mean, they, they still do a decent job showing off the power of these creatures, but because there's not sort of surrounding um, story contextualization in the same way as, as even something like Rakuman, we, we don't have as interesting of a time with this Gigas, and in fact this is probably the most forgettable Gigas of the game, it's just sort of a toss-away encounter, which is sort of disappointing. Still an interesting fight, to be sure. Um, the design is, is fun, it's sort of a mixture between some sort of scorpion-esque creature and, and other things, but it, it doesn't quite play out the way that you would like. Um, I'm going to try off just seeing how well we can do on the bigger attacks, and we'll focus the first round. Um, upgraded my ship equipment a little bit, so we'll be in good shape. The staging of this encounter is okay, we have the, the mob below us with the broken seal, but it, it's definitely not as, as interesting as something like what we had with Grendel, where the, um, you know, the forests were there and the gorge was there, and, you know, it's tromping through the land. And, and with Blueheim, we had 
as I pointed out before, Kazai, Mount Kazai in focus, and Yafutoma sort of there to elevate the stakes. Here it's sort of dead land. Um, and the only sort of interesting visual focal point we have is down below us. We still do get some very interesting attacks, though, which I, which I do enjoy. But it's sort of a traditional encounter, um, right? And we're not doing amazing damage there, so we're sort of chipping it down bit by bit. Um, obviously, Moonstone Cannon, a very important thing for us to fall back on and use. We'll build up, use Urala, sort of the same tactics that we've had before, but it will allow us to really expand our options, which is something I enjoy uh, quite a bit. And in fact, we can... This torpedo goes very far, so I could actually have two potential torpedo hits. I can do a lot in the next round. Um, I just sort of need to sit and make it so. So once again, we have that whole idea of the painter's canvas of, of the grid expanding as my ability to use more skills sort of builds up to. And that includes having equipment that expands the amount of space I can use on the grid as well. It's a nice change from what we had earlier in the game, but as much as I've sort of touted the amount of expression that it offers you, there are still some limitations, right? This We're limited in our modes of interaction. We only have so many different, you know, brushes with which to sort of paint the canvas, you know, torpedoes, sub-cannons crew members, magic, those sorts of things, and I'll probably use Increm to sort of give me an edge. And that's another sort of way to paint the space, right? I, I don't tend to use magic a lot, but it is an option. Um, but, so we have all of this, this notion of expanded interactive space, but it doesn't quite go um, as you might expect, and in fact, the Delphinus is very robust right now, so you would think, oh, the Gigas is very powerful, but with our expanded grid and sort of how hardy the ship is, this is almost a trivial encounter. Um, not trivial in a time investment sense, this certainly takes a lot of time for us to fight the creature, but, you know. Um, I always forget. Let's try attacking from above. Yeah, that's better. Sort of. Um, okay. So what we can do here, actually... So here's an example, again, of that expression. Right, I can have two torpedoes, a sub-cannon, and a cannon. Which is... really impressive, and then... You know, I'm, I'm using up a lot of that in this turn. But I want to take advantage of that two torpedo turn. And I can just use a cannon on the critical and sort of do all these things. Um, so, definitely I have a lot of ways to assert myself in the space. You know, not that modes of interaction are always about assertion, because that implies that it's sort of power fantasy driven. But it is definitely about reaffirming which might be some sort of linguistic doublethink on my part to just switch from one term to another, but a reaffirming of the, the options that you have. So here we can do a lot of damage. The torpedoes both hit, that's okay. We, we didn't get our cannon shots because of our position. But in the next turn, we'll have Moonstone Cannon, we'll have a, a lot of different ways, again, to attack. And we only need to worry so much about our health here. I have multiple ways to return myself to full health, including items and magic. So next round, we'll probably... We'll, we'll try to expand even more than we did in the last round, because uh, I sort of chose a disadvantageous position in this case. I do like talking about the moment-to-moment -moment, uh, tactical decisions of the airship combat because 
it seems uh, it seems really like a good way to stress how interesting these interactions can be. So I want to get the most bang for my buck, as it were. So I want to, you know, I want to buff myself. Um, I want to sort of get myself into safe positions by, you know, healing myself. I want to attack on the advantageous turns. To be sure, with the cannons, I'm not doing an extensive amount, but it still gets us into positions that are advantageous um, in, in terms of the raw numbers. Which is always something I find interesting, right? So you base... I mean, this happens in any RPG combat system anyway. Um, the numbers are the abstractions uh, that are really at play. The visuals and, the, and certain acts that you can take are just another way of expressing those abstractions. But... It's always amazed me how much your moment-to-moment decision-making changes to pace, uh, depending excuse me, on uh, resources. So, you know, HP, MP, spirit power in this case. Um, and I mean, that's that should be self-evident. Of course you're going to take different actions depending on where you are from a sort of numbers uh, and statistics point of view. But I find that that feeling of, of shifting priorities is something that the ship battles in Skies of Arcadia um, highlights very well. Because you only have so many options and because the, the fighting is a little bit more um, you know, strategic in the sense that you're planning for multiple turns, or at least you can see you're planning for the multiple turns, um, you really come to understand how much um, these things are affected by certain um, abstractions. Right, and here it's it's like we can build up again. Um, if we manage our resources and we just keep on using the Moonstone Cannon to knock them off off balance, we'll be okay. Um, Moonstone Cannon, fire! All of the encounters, or most of the encounters, having both um, dialogue options to change sort of your your tactical position, and then also in the moment reactive things. So in this case, the Moonstone Cannon will knock it off balance, which happens a lot, but with Gregorio, remember, it was using Quicka. Um, and I'm sure, I, f I forget off the top of my head even now, the way to mitigate the sort of um, gust of wind attack that Blueheim used against us. Um, but but there, are, there are definitely ways in which this combat is more reactive um, than sort of what we have when we're just fighting on foot. Which makes it a good indicator of, of, of sort of how to look at combat systems uh, in RPGs. Certainly there are RPGs that are far more reactive. Um, absolutely. But the pacing of, of these encounters can feel very deliberate in a way that I appreciate. But we will get our uh, Moon Cannon. Um, pursue an attack. Um, what? I feel like the game is lying to me about what options are available <laughs> at certain times. Um, that's not necessarily true, but it feels that way. Um, no, actually... Well, we have a torpedo hitting anyway, so we can do that. See, this is what I'm talking about, sort of changing your actions over and over. That's far more effective than what I was originally going to do. On the next Moonstone Cannon, we get it no matter what. I mean, obviously the pacing of the battles is always sort of centered around your special cannon whether it's the Harpoon Cannon or the Moonstone Cannon, but you, you still do have a lot of time in between those moments to sort of use what you have to the best of your abilities. Although, right there, you know, my targeting on the cannon was lost, and it's something I, I don't have a lot of indication sometimes of where I'm going to be spatially in relationship to the enemy, um, which 
makes combat a little bit more interesting in the fact that it can um, sort of surprise you, but it can also lead to certain frustrations. So if you plan a really big turn, then it turns out that you're just in the wrong position for your cannons to fire. Um, you don't have as much spatial control, even though everything does feel really extant, um, which I enjoy, but it's just... It doesn't quite always work out sometimes. Forgive me, too, for overusing the term interesting. Um, I just mean of note. Um, sometimes novel, but, but I don't even necessarily mean, um, you know, groundbreaking or particularly um, innovative. I just mean something that is worth us taking note of. And, and 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 understanding how certain things are recontextualized and changed. Um, so we are. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Guard will be quicker than focus. I don't know. Big hit. That might have done it right there. Yep. So. With the larger sort of space on our canvas to paint, we don't always need to rely on the Moonstone Cannon, which is nice. Thunder Cutlass, which may or may not be better than my current weapon. I have something forged by Ryu Khan, and his weapons tend to be really good. But here, sort of a very quick way of getting through a Gigas, which is nice because it gets us through our fetch quest. Now we will have all of the moon crystals um, that we need. But at the same time, it's also a matter of... The rush is good because it gets us through sort of the gamiest aspect of the plot. But it also reduced this encounter to something a little bit... Um, not entirely perfunctory, but it, it can feel that way. Right? We, we've sort of gotten to the end of the quest. And we will return to Crescent Isle to see sort of what our next step is going to be. And we will end the video there. So, uh, a lot of moving about the world today. And, and we'll sort of uh, go from there. So, just to show off the navigational capacity of the ship again. Um... I have no clue where we are on the map. Um, we just want to head east, but to show off how great it is to be able to move above the cloud layer, we'll just do one more quick journey. Tempting to do a cut there, but we've already cut as we've sort of teleported around the game world a lot. So let's, I mean, let's just show this off. The, the freedom that you have sort of once you're really going through this space. And look, it's really quick just to get to where you, you know, where you want to go. And, and there's something incredibly enjoyable about that freedom after having to go through the rest of the game world and, okay, now we can go through these spaces or these spaces, but hey, we get to see, uh, we get to see oh. Gilder. Um, really good to see old, uh, old faces. We saw Drachma, we see Gilder. <laughs> It's, uh, it's nice, but we'll also sort of figure out what our next step will be. Just sort of letting the mood sink in. I like that little moment of contemplation for a minute as we've sort of partially reached the end of our quest all of the moon crystals on the table there besides the silver one but the elders already have that I like how they're sort of vaguely etched with um, sort of arcane symbols too like I said crystals in games are just cool sort of a bittersweet uh, moment um, of the notion of Fina having to return home. So where does Fina come from? I've basically said it before anyway. 
Um, but, but she'll get explicit about it here. Where does she live? Where is she from? She's from the Great S Silver Shrine. It is a place high above the sky. So, way up above the lands. Uh, the Reigns of Destruction fell, and the Silvi Mages made the sky, and uh, not the sky, the shrine, rather, and, and flew up above the rest of the world as it was sort of burning. Um... And they sort of look down on the world and, and, and shepherd it, or, or, or so they uh, believe that is their job, the rest of the Sylvites. So now we need to figure out how we need to get um, to that space, so if we find Fina's old ship, We'll be able to do that, um, but it sank beneath the clouds. Now, there's a cloud layer, but then there's also, like, the cloud layer that leads into deep sky, and her ship has sunk far into deep sky. So we need to find uh, another way to get uh, to her home. <sighs> this sort of nice moment of... Having to follow through with your mission or staying with your friends. A uh, little bit of a pull for Fina. Um, which makes her more interesting to me as a character. If that pull wasn't there, if she was just driven by her mission and not uh, as empathetically drawn to, to the rest of her friends, I mean, that would be that would be one way to characterize her. But they don't do that. Um, they make her a little bit more... Uh, complete than that. <laughs> so, Gaussian plotting. Soon the foolish empress and the rest of the people of the world will bow before my might. No, not just the people. Right? Even the moons will be within my grasp. Um, Gaussian sort of showing his larger ambitions which seem simplistic you know take over the world but um the idea behind it is a little different and then also ramirez um smiling longingly at lord Ga gaussian um i don't know how much we've really talked about ramirez's sexuality but it definitely comes into play later in the game although the game is never explicit about um about his sexuality in particular. The game doesn't really talk very often about sexuality or anything like that. As we've noted before, there's no romance triangle in this game or anything like that. Um, but there are still definitely sexual components to the game. Um, the game just sort of keeps them not pushed to the side. It's just not something that they dwell on very much. So, I mean, I, I'll talk about it later on, but I find, um... I, I tend to find the relationship or the implied relationship between Vise, Ike, and Fina to be, like, a really nice way of the game expressing something close to a polygamous relationship or, like, an ase asexual friendship or something like that. Um, seeing how many discoveries we have. 49. We will uh, get more, but here, uh, I do this just so that we can get some more items. Once I hit, I hit 50, I'll get more items, but for now, um, let's just give some of these seeds to our characters. So parentheses seed is, is power, so vise. Um, Eichel seed. Vigor and quick will still give the vise. Eichel we will give to Fina. And we will head off on our journey armed with, uh, once we talk to him, some information from Gilder to guide us on our way. Or at least I believe that is how it will go. Uh, part of the reason I head up here is to check on Domingo, but also to make sure that I'm not missing out on any story things that might be happening on the island. So we'll talk to Gilder, uh, sort of get our... our, our 
our bearings, our, our, our course set, and go from there. I'm going to make a quick pit stop at Ryukan to see if maybe now I have the ability to to talk to him about the Vorlik Blade, because in upcoming segments I'll be able to get the materials necessary to forge the blade. Um, but I'm always curious about how the game informs the player about that, because you'd be very much forgiven for not um, catching on to the fact that that can happen. So yeah, he doesn't say anything yet, but... In time, we will be able to have him forge a wonderful weapon for us. Um, pretty much the strongest weapon in the game. I think there were sort of, not really like DLC weapons, because DLC wasn't necessarily a concept, but there were items you could get via online interactions um, in the original Skies of Arcadia. Um, so something like, I think it was the Skywing for Ica. And there was, like, a tuna fish, like, joke weapon and stuff. Um, you could get those. And you can get them in Skies of Arcadia Legends because it tends to cut out all of the weird um, segmented stuff that the game d would have on the Dreamcast. But yeah, Vorlik Blade's awesome, and I want it. And so he's going to give us information because Gilder is always the man with information. Valua has begun advancing into the lower altitudes. North of Pirate Isle, beneath the clouds, they're building a base on Dangrowl Isle. It's just a rumor, but I hear they're building a ship that can go into deep sky. Well, now you tell me, Gilder. So our next location to Brave will be Dangrowl Island. Home of Valuan Research. Which is uh, really great. I enjoy, I enjoy that space. I enjoy returning to value in spaces every now and then to remind us sort of of our, of our foes. But that is it for now. We have all the moon crystals. We are going to find a way to get Fina's ship and sail off towards uh, the Great Silver Shrine. It'll be a little bit of a process going to Dangrel Island, recovering the ship, but we now know the course for our... Uh, the rest of our journey now that we have gotten all the moon crystals thank you so much for watching uh, uh and always uh, always for putting up with my rambling um i love you very much i will see you around later